So I'm interested in how companies work. And th this time we're uh, going to talk to Revolution Analytics about what's happening inside big enterprises and the world of big data and what they're learning. And we're going to talk about it right now, big data and enterprises. <laughs> Hi. And who are, who are you? <laughs> I'm uh, David Smith. I'm a data scientist and I'm the VP of Marketing and Community at Revolution Analytics. So, uh, yeah. Tell me a little bit about yourself. About myself, yeah. I've been working in the company for about five years. I'm uh, really passionate about data. I've been doing data analysis for a long, long time. I got started with the programming language R about uh, 10, 11 years ago. And you know, for the first time, it was just a language that really let me think in statistics and in data. And I've been helping evangelize that for a long, long time. Uh, I joined Revolution Analytics about five years ago when they started the company to bring R to the enterprise. Yeah. So it was a really good opportunity for me to actually take all this amazing work that was being done in the community and help enterprises actually apply statistical models to what they do. Now, I usually study startups, so I, I don't study your world very mm -hmm. much at all. And I, and, uh, but I like to understand how companies work and how they're innovating and mm -hmm. how they're trying to find a new path through life. Yeah. And most of that is uh, through data, looking at, at what their data... Well, tell me about the things that big enterprises study, because you deal with big enterprises, yeah. not really startups, you know, like Flipboard or right. something like that, right? Yeah, so I work with, you know, big companies that, for example, are trying to figure out their marketing programs, you know, how much money they should be putting into advertising versus social media versus television and so forth. Uh, I work for big companies that build products or create drugs and do all sorts of experiments and try and figure out, you know, what features or what capabilities, how they manufacture it, you know, how to improve the production process. All of these things, you know, involve massive amounts of data and they have data science teams uh, that work with those data sets and then try and solve the company's problems with data. Now, do these companies have the data already coming in from, from like cash registers or the modern equivalent, <laughs> Square? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, or do they have to actually figure out how to instrument their company to generate these flows of data so that you can have something to study? Yeah, I mean, especially in the big companies, it's, it's really starting to change now. I mean, you've got your sort of your Googles and your LinkedIn's and your Twitters. You know, they started their businesses just by collecting massive amounts of data from the web. But big companies haven't had that culture, I think, you know, at least until recently. Um, you know, if they wanted to solve a problem, it was like, let's do a survey or let's do an experiment, let's collect some data. And, you know, all that data that was being generated, you know, by the cash machines, by in-store, you know, all the sorts of transactional records, a lot of the times, you know, it might have been kept but not looked at or even just thrown away. Yeah. But ever since kind of the big data revolution, you know, especially when Hadoop came about, you know, suddenly there's this, you know, cost-effective platform the companies can, can use just to suck in all the data that's coming in. And they did that. And then they're trying to think out, well, well, now we've got all this data, what can we actually do with it? How can we actually change the way we do business, improve our products, um, improve our relationships with our customers using all the insights that live in that data in the same way that Google, LinkedIn, and Facebook have done? Yeah. Many companies are, uh, I just wrote a book called Age of mm -hmm. Context, yeah. which is about how mobile and mm -hmm. web and social and mm -hmm. Uh, location yeah. and sensors are going to change businesses yeah. and cities and all mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Uh, but we aren't there yet. I mean, I, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I go to the Half Moon Bay Ritz. They mm -hmm. have four computers there. Mm -hmm. They are generating data, yeah. but they're not hooked up together. They really don't know anything about me as a customer, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to change. Yeah. That yeah. has to change. Otherwise, Four Seasons are going <laughs> to kick their ass. Because right? right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Four Seasons is ahead of them and, and already hooked up to their systems and yeah. are using the, and learning more about the customer so they can serve their customer in a new way. And so the CEO is going to say mm -hmm. to these big companies, you better learn more about your customer because our competition is going to do it and then we're, then we're not as profitable. Yeah. Um, how does a company make that shift to collecting more data? And mm -hmm. then how do they decide on it? how to see the needles and the pile of needles that are going to come in, you know, because yeah. how, how do you know where there's any value in, in the flows of data that are going to come into a modern company? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, companies, you know, really are trying hard to do this because, you know, consumer expectations have changed. Yeah. You know, we as people in the Facebook era with our iPhones and iPads and Google Glass, 
you know, have this expectation that a company is going to be able to anticipate our needs because that information is there, but a lot of big companies just haven't really yet figured out how to put all that together. But you know, these big companies have made a lot of investment in collecting all this data about the individuals that, that they interact with, about their experience. They're investing heavily in social, for example, to try and drag in this information that's available in the public web uh, to help them do what they do. I think you know, a, a good example is a, a company I work with is, uh, is Datasong. And they help big companies solve their marketing problems. You know, we've always said that um, you know, half of the money we spend on marketing is wasted, but we don't know which half. It's actually 90% <laughs> of the money. <laughs> right. but, but that's the really cool thing is yeah. big data can really change that because there, there's so much information available to companies now about what people do. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's scary when you think about it, the amount of information that a company like you know, Axiom, for example, collects about individuals. But the flip side of that is that companies can really use that information effectively to deliver the kind of experience you're talking about, like when you check into a hotel. Anyway, this company I work with that's you know, figuring out marketing, I don't know if you've ever sort of you know, visited a retail store, you've filled out a form when you've bought a blender or something, and suddenly you get a catalog delivered to your yeah. house every month, you know, that kind of thing. It's very expensive, but for a long time, just companies did it because it was the only thing they knew how to do. But now you can actually have a look at a history of just one person first of all, and see, first of all, what are their demographics you know, from the data companies? What are they like? Where do they live? How old are they? What kind of friends do they have? Then have a look at their history. Got a catalog, got an email, saw a billboard, visited a store. And I know that because I can connect the Wi-Fi signal from the cell phone to other sort of social information. Uh, I just yeah. did, interviewed a yeah. guy who just won the demo conference yeah. award and is mm. going to uh, change the store with mm. low energy Bluetooth radios and NFC yeah. to actually know exactly. you walked in the store and, mm. and where you are in the yeah. store and show you actually, That's the point. This information exists and companies that can figure out how to use it can do amazing things. Yeah. And, it, and it's just, it doesn't really help looking at one history. You just look at me and my history of my sort of email catalog, visited store, bought a blender. That doesn't really give you a lot of information. But when you aggregate that over thousands upon thousands of consumers and see patterns to see that for people in a certain age range, if they received a catalog over the next couple of months, they'll make more purchases on average. But for people that are younger, for example, they don't. You can then realize, well, let's cut out all the catalogs to the young people. Now, it's a lot more complicated than that because the models are much more discerning, but it really helps companies you know, address their bottom line, do things more effectively, and give a good experience to their to their customers, and I'm happy that I don't throw away my catalog in the recycling every month. Right. Yeah. So there probably has to be a separate effort to collect that data, but let, let's yeah. say you yeah. have some, uh, yeah. you have a petabyte of data about yeah. you know X Y Z, yeah. you know, knowing uh, what what people spent on mm -hmm. on in the store. H how do they decide what tools to use? You know, because R yeah. is probably not the only uh, mm -hmm. programming technology to use uh, to to analyze yeah. the big data, right? How do they decide? Yeah. I mean, for a long time, you know, companies, especially big companies that have done any kind of statistical modeling have used, you know, legacy systems that were developed in the mainframe era. But especially with the open source revolution, you know, pretty much every statistician, data scientist, people studying machine learning at university have learned the R language. And so it's very natural then for companies to say, let's embrace that talent, um, set up a platform around open source R to be able to actually build these statistical models. But then you've got to figure out, well, they've got to work with big data. They've got to be able to integrate into our operational systems so I can be sort of giving somebody a real-time experience when they're in the store or visiting a hotel. Um, and so what we do at Revolution Analytics is build on top of open source R so it does work with big data. It scales to these massive volumes. It can run these models in Hadoop or in, in databases and then integrate them into the real-time operational systems um, so you get these instantaneous experiences. Yeah. If you're an executive with one of these teams, what yeah. should you be expecting this team to do? You know, what yeah. should you be asking this team to do? Well, I think... What's possible yeah, I mean, that wasn't possible you, you, three you years You start ago? with the standard business problems. You know, we're spending too much money on marketing. We need to cut down and, and optimize. Uh, we're getting too many bad quality products coming off the production line. You know, how do we actually fix that problem? These are very traditional sort of statistical problems that companies are very used to doing. And there's a lot more data to bring to bear to those questions now. So data scientists have a lot more flexibility and more power to improve those things. But I think what's, what's really interesting 
is that companies are now able to answer questions that they never even thought of answering before. By giving data scientists the power within the organization to actually explore the data sources they have, you can, they, they can figure out things like, well, it's this particular type of person that tends to visit our hotels that wants you know, a VIP experience. I can identify even before they get to the hotel based on their registration information that this is somebody that should have a good experience, even though they're not a loyalty member, for example, and then set the operations up to deal with that. You know, I'm interviewing the uh, CIO of Facebook. Yeah. And he, he, Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg runs his company through mm -hmm. data, yeah. and they ask all sorts of funny questions. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, you'll get a question on on mm -hmm. the newsfeed, like, yeah. "Do you understand privacy?" And they'll even lead you through, you know, "Do you understand the impact of, mm -hmm. of clicking this button?" Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah. and they collect that data, mm -hmm. and if, if if enough of their users don't, then yeah. they'll rework that feature, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that tells them what to do. Right. Yeah. Is that is that how the modern company is going to be working in the future? Is yeah, to I think, ask these kinds of questions ongoing mm -hmm. of your customers. Yeah, I think I think that's even the next level. I mean, a lot, a lot of the thing that people don't realize about big data is that it doesn't necessarily have all the answers to your questions in it if nobody's ever collected that information before. And I think what the whole data science culture has brought to companies is this idea of experimentation and statistical analysis. Yeah. You know, if we're not sure about whether people understand privacy and that data isn't, it doesn't exist in our big, big database, there are very sort of rigorous procedures that statisticians know how to do to answer these questions of a sample of people and make sure it's a representative sample and get this information very quickly and efficiently for companies. No, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, what else are you seeing and how are uh, companies using big data that they weren't doing two or three years ago? Yeah, I think visualizations of data is another thing that's really changed. Um, you know, for a long time when we thought of looking at data beyond you know, a spreadsheet, you know, we'd think of bar charts and pie charts and things like that, very yeah. simple representations. But now if you flick through the New York Times or for me, swipe through the New York Times or look at The Economist, you can see a lot more sophisticated representations of data that really give deep insights into what's going on beyond simple summaries like bars. And I think it's really exciting for me because as a statistician, you know, I read that book by uh, Tufty, you know, 20 yeah. years ago, uh, exploring data. And you know, to see those kinds of techniques come into sort of the regular mainstream is really exciting. That's coming into companies as well. I think even the business level executives are getting more in tune with the ideas of don't just show me simple summaries of data, show me a picture of the data. Tell me a story about what's going on in my business with data. And that's again something that the R language is really, really powerful at that because it's a programming language. It's, you're not just limited to a palette of things you see in your spreadsheet. You can combine together all sorts of things, add annotations, and really tell a story for people so they can look down deep into their data and really understand what's going on. Can this be done in real time? Because I, I walk into a lot of companies, particularly startups now, but even bigger ones that have a, mm -hmm. a network operations center or, mm -hmm. or a set of six screens on the wall yeah. above their team, you know, <laughs> and it tells them about the health of that company. Yeah. And I, I imagine if mm -hmm. I was the CEO, I would assign one or two of these screens to this kind of analysis and, and storytelling. Tell mm -hmm. me something about what's going on in, in our stores today. Yeah. You know? I mean, there's artistry in this process. I mean, you don't yeah. last like Andy Warhol if you can do like a painting in real time. Yeah. But nonetheless, you know, you can spend a day, data scientist can spend some time working with a data set, you know, figuring out the bits and pieces that go together to lay out, you know, a really compelling representation of that data. That can take a while. But then you can deploy that as code into the operational system so that the business user can actually get an access to this representation that a data scientist has designed in real time by running it against the latest data. You know, kind of like a silk screen process yeah. uh, for data visualizations. Yeah. yeah. What, what else do companies need to know when they're evaluating a company like yours? Like, because I'm sure there's competitors, right? Yeah. To, to what you do. Yeah. Uh, how do they evaluate, you know, how does a CTO or yeah. a CEO or a COO, yeah. you know, somebody who's design, whose mm. job it is to make his employees mm. more productive, yeah. how, how does that person uh, mm. evaluate? Yeah, I, I think first of all, look at the talent you need. Um, so when you're looking for data scientists, look at the types of skills that they have. As I said earlier on, you'll find most of them will be familiar with the R language. That's an excellent choice for that, that environment. 
think the second thing to consider is your data environments. You know, are you still working with relational databases? Are you working with NoSQL? Is your data sitting in Hadoop or is it sitting in sort of data warehouses? And making sure that whatever technology platform you make available to your data scientists, they have fast and easy access to those data sources. You know, one of the worst things as, you know, I'm speaking for experience here, you know, as a data scientist, you're, you're building the predictive model that is working with amazing amounts of sensor data to figure out that when I turn my wrist, my watch comes on, you know, that kind of thing. But if every time I tweak that model, I've got to wait overnight before I can see if it works, I'm not going to iterate very much. I'm not going to try many different data sources. So making sure it's a platform that lets the data scientists, number one, access the data very quickly. And when they build these predictive models, they can turn them around in a few minutes instead of a few hours. Now the legacy systems were built in the mainframe era before parallelization, before big memory. So they can take hours to run a fairly simple model with big data. One of the things that we've done with Revolution or Enterprise is make sure that it works in parallel systems, it works in the databases or in the Hadoop cluster. So these models run very, very quickly and the data scientists can be more productive by going through more iterations of models to make them better predictors. Just to finish up, what, what does Revolution Analytics actually do? Do you sell me a system that I, uh, mm -hmm. load on my data center. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me what I buy from you yeah, and how much right. it would cost. Sure, yeah. We sell you a software product. It's called Revolution R Enterprise. Uh, it's software that you install on your workstations or your servers or your clusters. And um, it works on cloud or, or, or do I need dedicated servers? Uh, most companies install it on dedicated servers within their organizations. You can also run it in virtual memories, in virtual machines in the cloud if you prefer. Okay. Yeah. And how much does this cost? Um, it starts at $4,500 uh, for a single user desktop, so for a single data scientist. Then for companies that are putting these models into production, say in a, in a, in a Hadoop cluster with hundreds of nodes, we price it by the node that it runs on. Very cool. Mm -hmm. um, where do we learn more about it? Uh, you can find more about Revolution R Enterprise at revolutionanalytics.com. Very cool. Thanks for giving me a little taste into the world of big data inside big companies. It's my pleasure. Thank this you. isn't going to be something for a, a little <laughs> tiny startup for two guys in a garage, right? But it's interesting to hear uh, how these companies are uh, shifting what they do. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you.